walking along Boston's Freedom Trail is like taking a step back in time to the 18th century. It's a great place to meet a fellow chef, my friend Chef Gerard from the Omni Parker House in Boston. Hello, Chef. Welcome to Boston. What a perfect spot to meet. You all recognize the fellow behind me? Yes. It's our friend Ben Franklin. You know, Ben Franklin was a gourmet. I heard as that. As much as you. A fellow gourmet yes. and a fellow gourmet. The whole world always talks about the dishes that were invented or right. first made here in the Omni Parker House. Right. So what are you going to show us today? A couple of them we're going to look at is Boston Scrod, Boston Brown Bread, Boston Baked Beans, Boston Cream Pie. Also, we're going to look at Parker House Rolls. Can't wait for that. Yes, it's fantastic. Absolutely. And you're going to give me a little stroll to, to Boston on the way yes. to the... Yes, I'd really like to show you our hay market. Fantastic. And you must come along too for this spectacular taste of history. There are many historic sites that tell the story of Boston's role in the birth of a new nation. But Boston is not just the birthplace of the American Revolution. It's also home to an iconic landmark, which has been associated with Boston's culture and identity since the 1800s, the Omni Parker House Hotel. We're the oldest hotel in Boston. We've been in operation since 1855. So not only does it make us the oldest hotel here in the city, but we're the longest continuously operating hotel in the United States. In the mid-20s, they actually leveled the old Parker House and built the new one, which is the one we have today. Curiously, in the midst of that, they kept one annex with 80 rooms open, allowing it never to close, which is why the Parker House is the oldest continuously operating hotel in the U.S. Founded by Harvey D. Parker in 1855, the hotel has hosted an impressive list of authors, athletes, politicians, and actors. In the 18th century, travelers to Boston found modest inns and taverns, much like the city tavern in Philadelphia. In the 19th century, with ship and coach travel, a new demand for upscale hotels was created. 1830s, 40s, 50s, the war was over, culture was starting, people had money, people were traveling. Restaurants in hotels at that time were not very great. You all came to the table, ate the same thing, and room and board were all together. Harvey Parker separated that, which was called the European Plan, and allowed people to dine at different times to order off the menu to get a variety of different foods. So it was pretty revolutionary. In order to provide guests with the gourmet fare he insisted upon, Parker hired a French chef known as Sanzian. Salaries at this time were very low. You could have gotten a chef for like $8 a week at that time in 1855. He paid Sanzian several thousand dollars a year to be here. Sanzian's innovative menus, paired with the hotel's comfortable lodging, were a huge hit for important guests and Bostonians alike. Anybody who was anybody stayed at the Parker House. This was the place to be. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Hawthorne lived here within Boston, Cambridge, Concord, and they wanted a place to hang out and talk. So they created this thing called the Saturday Club, and they would have dinner and drinks and talk and read to each other. When someone like Charles Dickens came in from England, he stayed here, hung with these guys, stayed at the Parker House Hotel. So this was the center of the literary world, right here. Set in close proximity to the State House and City Hall, the Parker House was also the center for many politicians for years to come. Among the people who were very famous for coming here, James Michael Curley, several times a mayor, several times in prison, and quite the character. The other politician whose family spent many, many decades here were the Kennedys. Stories tell of a six-year-old John F. Kennedy giving his first public speech in the press room of the Parker House. Over two decades later, the same room saw him announce his candidacy for Congress. This is the table that John F. Kennedy sat at and proposed to Jacqueline Bouvier. And people deliberately choose this table because they want to be part of history, but also proposals are done here all the time. Well, let's uh, have a toast to the Kennedys. To this day, the spirit of the Parker House continues to live on, and this venerable hotel remains a popular destination for people from around the world. You're not gonna miss us if you're here to see the historic sites of Boston and come and get a sense of the history that we have to offer and what Harvey Parker started here so long ago.
Walking along Boston's Freedom Trail is like taking a step back in time to the 18th century. This red brick path is home to many significant historical sites, including Boston Common, the Massachusetts State House, and Faneuil Hall. So, Chef, this is the old state house where the Boston Massacre occurred. This was the spot that really put John Adams on the map. What a lot of history in this town. Absolutely. Topic. We take it for granted, really. And we're going to be proceeding over to the hay market to look at some fresh vegetables. Beautiful, look at that. Beautiful, yeah, beautiful awesome mushrooms. mushrooms. Shiitake, portobello, oysters, cremini, fantastic. You can pretty much find anything you want that's grown. It's been here since colonial days. The oldest established continuous public market in the United States. How many do you want, Chef? Two or three? Can you use them all? Hey Otto, why can't we get jackets like these guys? You should. I'll give you mine. <laughs> this is Boston. This is Haymarket. This is what we're all about here. So many nice people, nice interaction. They're proud of their work. That's what it's all about, baby. Food, fresh. Gerard, what a fantastic trip this morning to Haymarket. I mean, I've been there many times before, but it's always refreshing to interact with the people. So now we're going to do your world famous New England clam chowder. Cooking on a really beautiful antique candy stove. Some of the research I've done on the clam chowder, it came here most likely with the first French chef that we know of that Harvey Parker employed yes, here. Chef Sun Ziang. Beautiful. Everything tastes better with bacon, don't you oh, agree? Oh, absolutely. I'm going to add a little bit of onion. Uh -huh. If there's bacon to be had, it's in New England. Absolutely. <laughs> and I don't think you guys cook anything without bacon. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Next, I'm going to put a little bit of celery. What really makes the difference on a good clam chowder is the ingredients that go into it, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Then I add some nice whole creamy butter. butter. I'm going to put the garlic in. Perfect. And now I add a little bit of the flour. And you use all-purpose, I assume? Yes, all-purpose all flour. Mm -hmm. And this with the sweated vegetables, the bacon and the butter, uh, that actually makes your roux, which is your thickening agent for the chowder. Well, next, Walter, we could add in our fresh clams and clam juice. There we go. Beautiful, beautiful. We can add a little bay leaf. We can add a little bit of Worcestershire. All right. Fresh thyme. A little bit of salt and white pepper. Oh boy, Woo. you see again, it's so simple, but it's basically because you're using ingredients that are fresh and traditional. Absolutely, yep. And look at it. Starting to thicken as we yep. speak. So I want to remove the two bay leaves that All I right. put in. That's why I leave them whole, so I know I put in two. We have the potatoes. Yep. You blanched them whole. Yes, so there's not an over amount of starch in the actual potato. Got you. I cut all the vegetables, bacon, as well as the potatoes uniform so that it's very palatable on a teaspoon when you eat the chowder itself. Makes sense. And add the uh, heavy cream. And I would tell you, from my experience, the better the cream, the better the chowder. <laughs> Look at that. Beautiful. Spectacular store. It really is. I mean, look at it. We did it right there. So simple. So excellent. Chef, since you're here in Beantown, I figured it would make Boston baked beans. I never believe I hear a guy from Boston actually say Beantown, you know? <laughs> I have to give Boston a lot of credit because so many things really started here and started right here in your hotel. So, saute the bacon here. Add to a crisp. Nice. We're going to place our navy beans in your bean crock into the bean crock <laughs> that have been soaked overnight between 8 and 12 hours. Mm -hmm. They're partially blanched. I add my brown sugar. I add my molasses. Mmm, look at that. Beautiful. I add a little bit of dry mustard. So now we gotta do is just add the bacon on top. Just add the bacon on top. And then the oven, and how long in the oven do you say it? 250, uh, 250 four? degrees. Four? Approximately four to six hours. And about the last half hour of cooking, uncovered. Uncovered, yeah. Chef, have a taste of the beans. Let me see here. Just as I remembered it. 
beautiful. Chef, fantastic. From Bean Town for a taste of history, fantastic beans. What you got here? Well, I have a little George's Bank card here for our famous scrod dish here at the Omni Parker House. Which we know definitely, historically, 100% accurate, was really developed here. The name was coined right here in the Parker House in Boston. Scrod was known as Whitefish of the Day. Nothing really has changed. And it's still one of your top sellers? It absolutely is. I'm going to start by taking my little cod friend Finn off here. Scrod is a terminology for preparation. It's not a fish, right? Right. There is no such thing as, There's no such thing as a scrod. As a scrod. Fish. No. There was a myth that the scrod was white fish of the day, but if it was spelled S C R O D, it meant cod. And if it was S C H R O D, it meant haddock. Hmm. Knowing that this dish, Harvey Parker already had it on this menu, this is amazing. This is like a really true taste of history right here because we are going right back into 150 years and then some, you know? Absolutely. So after you fillet it, the most important part is the marinating, right? Yes. Basically about a seven ounce portion. Mm -hmm. Skin on, always, mm -hmm. served here at the Parker House. All right. Now comes the trick of the trade. It's a little bit of oil, a little bit of our non-fat cream. Just kidding. It's got to be heavy butter fat that gets the flavor. I already yes. figured it out. At least 40%, yes. <laughs> a little bit of lemon juice, mm -hmm. fresh squeezed. And how long do how long you, you keep the marinating process going? It's good if you do it at least three to six hours. A little bit of paprika. Mm -hmm. A little bit of Worcestershire. Mm -hmm. A little love with a little salt and pepper. It's beautiful. Looks like a ready to eat already. <laughs> the marinating of this process is what makes it a squat. Absolutely. So it's a cut until now. It's a squad now, right? Got You're it? right. Cut, squad. <laughs> Fantastic. Nice. Now a little butter on top? Of course. Rich cracker crumbs. Again, another New England favorite. Yep. And then the oven it goes. What's the cooking time, chef, for that? Approximately about 12 minutes. It cooks very cooks quick. Cooks quickly. Key glaze with white wine. A little bit of white wine. Nice. A little bit more butter. Uh huh. And into the oven we go. And here you have it, chef. This is the Omni Parker House Big Scrub. That is truly a taste of history because everybody's trying to duplicate you. Nobody can. One of a kind. Fantastic chef, I appreciate it. Many well-known dishes were perfected right here at the Omni Parker House. One of the things that we're trying to do, that Harvey started certainly, is continue this culinary legacy that brought the Parker House roll into existence, that brought the Boston cream pie into existence. Parker House rolls, they were very, very popular, but it was a secret recipe, much like Coca-Cola is today. The Parker House would send these rolls all around the world. People talked about it. It was just a miraculous thing to have these soft, fluffy, moist, buttery rolls. Someone who loved rolls and loved baked goods was Eleanor Roosevelt. Both she and her husband, Franklin, came here. Eleanor fell in love with the Parker House rolls, and the legend has gone on for years that she was the one that broke the secret because she requested the secret recipe. Hi, Laura. So good to meet you. Nice to meet you. What makes those Parker House rolls so special and so well-renowned? Me. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where do we get started? We are going to start with our flour. All right. Two pounds of flour. And next, we're going to use our sugar because they're a little bit on the sweet side. Eight ounces. One ounce of salt. Two ounces of yeast. You use any special and kind of yeast? Or just cake a yeast. Cake yeast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Break that up right into our flour and our sugar and salt mixture. So how much of the shortening do you need? Eight ounces. So the scale is very sophisticated. <laughs> it is a Parker House original. Thank you. So now that we have the shortening and the yeast broken into the flour, sugar, and salt, we're going to add two ounces of milk powder. Thank what you. does the milk powder do? A little bit of flavor, and then it also makes it very soft. That's what does it. Mm -hmm. Because the one thing about the pie guys, well, they are so soft and so delicious. Are, yeah. And the only problem with the middle is you cannot only eat one ever. <laughs> so now what we're going to do, we're going to create our little well. 
Lovely. It's such a simple roll. There's really no big science to it. No, but no. I guess it's just the goodness and the flavor, and obviously you got to make it fresh. Now I'm going to take it out of the bowl, and I'm going to knead it on the marble table until the top is nice and smooth, and all the dough is stuck together and very cohesive. And so now I'm going to let it sit and double in size. Perfect. So two hours later, here we go. So now we go over to our press, our Duchess press. So what we'll do is we'll flip over our dough and we smush it down. Uh -huh. We'll put a little bit of flour on top so that it doesn't stick the to machine. the individual gotcha. dividers. And then we slide it in, press down on the white, the silver pull, and then you have to use a little arm strength. Fantastic. See how nicely divided it is? Now, we're going to brush it with melted butter. Generously. Nice. <laughs> yes, exactly. Before we fold it over. So now, here's the part that makes it the signature. And you stretch it, and you fold it over. Now, that is cool. Let me try one. Your turn. Stretch. Stretch. And this then far? fold. That's good. Mm -hmm. And then and fold, fold over. over. And you'll want to create a little bit more of a lip there so that when it proofs, it doesn't separate. Oh, I see, so we're gonna come mm -hmm. closer to it, so yes. like so. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to fill up our tray. And then it goes in the proof box? Goes in the proof box, 45 minutes. Okay. So now you can see that it's doubled in size. So now we're going to put it in the oven at 350 for 20 minutes. And then we put butter and then we and eat then it. And then we put butter on it. And then we eat, <laughs> then we eat them. When you travel the world, obviously Boston is a very important city. Yes. Wherever I go to, people really think of Boston where the revolution started. And it kind of did in 1773. But you know, there's so many foods almost you wouldn't expect to find, such as the Boston brown bread, such as the Parker House Hall, such as the Squad, etc., etc. It's very important for me to show our audience really quick how this Boston brown bread is made, because it's very different than many of the other breads we make, you know? Yes. Yes, it so is. tell me what, what goes in it. We have some raisins, wheat flour, cornmeal, wheat germ, milk powder. Now we'll put in our molasses. We'll mix this all together. This is not baked, so mm -hmm. we steam it by covering it with aluminum foil so it stays very moist whole milk. Thank you. Fantastic. So now we just go ahead and put it into our pan. You don't, you don't need to let it pull for anything at all, right? No, not at all. Just put it in there, cover it, and put it in the steamer. Yes, three hours. Laura, something smells awfully good around here. <laughs> Can you smell those rolls? You think they're done? I do. Oh, and now they're done. Beautiful. They are lovely. Look at that. Perfect. Golden brown. And now and to now, get the, the last. Brush with it. butter. How oh, beautiful. That is. A, oh, they smell good. What, a, what an aroma. Don't you think? It's like, yeah. it, it, it just wants you to just, <laughs> bite, well, bite in the whole thing. Be careful. Don't burn yourself. Let me get you one, chef. Yep. I'm dying for it. How nice and brown. The butter is still warm. There's only one word for that. Spectacular. Thank you. Mm. So here's the brown bread. It's beautiful. Nice and dense. Lovely. Lots of raisins. Mm-hmm. Mm. Like I said, there's a million recipes for that, but that is a very, very good recipe. Look at this beautiful Boston cream pie. What a work of art. But you know what? doesn't look like a pie to me. I don't know. <laughs> what, what do you think? It's not a pie. In the 1800s, 1900s, they only had pie pans. Now we actually use cake pans. So basically we kept the name the same, but yes. we're making it as a cake. And this was the first ever produced right here in the Parker House in Boston. So it is absolutely... It's 100% ours. Now, Chef, let me show you how we make our Boston cream pie. I'm dying to see it. So what are so we doing now? So the first now? step is we have to make the cake. So we have our shortening. The sugar, we need three pounds. Flour, how much you need? Four pounds of flour. Four pounds of flour. 
We need two ounces of baking powder. Now we're going to add our eggs. We have one quart of eggs. So now we can start adding our milk. And this should be three cups. Always careful, you can always add, you can never take away. Exactly. So what are you looking for the consistency of that? It's kind of like a loose. Yes, dough. exactly. Yeah, but it's still all very cohesive, yeah, put yeah, together yeah. very nicely. Beautiful. But we want it to be a little bit more stable than a traditional sponge. And we will just go ahead and smooth that out to create a You do not let later. it sit. You just put it in the oven and it goes. And we put it right in, in the oven. 45 minutes at 300 degrees. So our next step is we're making the fantastic pastry cream that makes that Boston cream pie so yes. spectacular. And uh, today we are in luck. We're using a stove that's over 100 years old and then some that used to be a stable in every great pastry shop in this country. This is a candy stove where they made the sugar on it. So what goes into your pastry cream? So we have our milk on to boil over a double boiler so there's boiling. water underneath. Yep. Then and we have our sugar. Good. Yep. And our cake flour. All right. So we're going to add a little bit of the cornstarch mm -hmm. to our flour and our sugar. Yeah. We'll mix that up so we don't have any really big lumps. Yep. Go ahead and pour our eggs in. You can see it already starting to come together. So now because we don't want to curdle our eggs, we're just going to add a little bit of milk at a time. And this will just make sure that we don't have scrambled eggs in the process. Not a good idea. No. <laughs> nice and light. Perfect. Now we're going to add our egg mixture into our milk mixture. So now as it starts to cook, you can see it kind of starting to get a little bit thicker along the sides, mm -hmm. becoming more of that pudding consistency. So let's go ahead and add our butter. Yep, yeah, butter then. And just let that melt, and then we will transfer it to our dish that we will... Later refrigerate. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Chef. You're welcome. So the next step is to let it cool for about a half an hour. Mm -hmm. We're going to lay parchment directly on top of it, right on the surface, so that it doesn't create a film, and it stays the really nice pudding consistency for us. And then we'll put it in the refrigerator overnight. That's fantastic. Laura, our pastry cream looks fantastic. We had it set overnight. We have our cake now also set up overnight. We're going to slice it in half. Put one layer Got to the you. side. Mm -hmm. So now we have our layer that we'll put the pastry cream on. A lot of people come here to the park house just to have this dessert. So now that we have our pastry yeah. cream layer, we're going to put the top part of our cake. And now we're going to pastry cream the outside. This is semi-sweet chocolate chunks with heavy cream, melted together. So about three ounces of chocolate. Take our spatula and make a smooth layer. Beautiful. The next step is white. our white chocolate. We do the spider web, so you start in the center with the circles and having the cake turner makes it, easy. Makes it so easy. And you don't have to move your hand, you just turn there we are. Skewer. Straight through the lines into the center. You make it look so easy. Laura. And then back out to the other direction. You make it look so easy. <laughs> Five years of practice. So this is the tricky part where you actually have to pick up the cake you, yeah. to be able to scoop the almonds and make, sure they and make sure that they stick. Beautiful. So let me now be the judge. Laura. I want to really thank you. It was such an enlightening experience today. Piker House Rolls, brown bread, and the pièce de résistance, the Boston cream pie. I still don't know about the pie. It's a tart to me. What's a pie to you? <laughs> it's a pie. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I want to thank the culinary team for letting us in your kitchens to really explore history, the foods on the Piker House, which is a true a taste, taste of history. Of history from the Parker House in Boston.